Chapter 13. Annabeth Tries to Swim Home I'd finally found something I was really good at. The Queen Anne's revenge responded to my every command. I knew which ropes to hoist, which sails to raise, which direction to steer. We plowed through the waves at what I figured was about ten knots. I even understood how fast that was. For a sailing ship, pretty darn fast. It all felt perfect, the wind in my face, the waves breaking over the prow. But now that we were out of the danger, all I could think about was how much I missed Tyson and how worried I was about Grover. I couldn't get over how badly I'd messed up on Circe's Island. If it hadn't been for Annabeth, I'd still be a rodent, hiding in a hutch with a bunch of cute furry pirates. I thought about what Circe had said. See, Percy, you've unlocked your true self. I still felt changed, not just because I had a sudden desire to eat lettuce. I felt jumpy, like the instinct to be sca a scared little animal was now a part of me. Or maybe it had always been there. That's what really worried me. We sailed through the night. Annabeth tried to help me keep lookout, but sailing didn't agree with her. After a few hours rocking back and forth, her face turned the color of guacamole, and she went below to lie a ham in a hammock. I watched the horizon. More than once I spotted monsters. A plume of water as tall as a skyscraper spewed into the moonlight. A row of green spines slithered across the waves, something maybe a hundred feet long, reptilian. I didn't really want to know. Once, I saw Nereids, the glowing lady spirits of the sea. I tried to wave at them, but they disappeared into the depths, leaving me unsure whether they'd seen me or not. Sometime after midnight, Annabeth came up on deck. We were just passing a smoking volcano island. The sea bubbled and steamed around the shore. One of the forges of Hephaestus, Annabeth said, where he makes his metal monsters. Like the bronze bulls? She nodded. Go around. Far around. I didn't need to be told twice. We steered clear of the island, and soon it was just a red patch of haze behind us. I looked at Annabeth. The reason you hate Cyclops so much, the story about how Thalia really died, what happened? It was hard to see her expression in the dark. I guess you deserve to know, she said finally. The night Grover was escorting us to camp. He got confused, took some wrong turns. Remember he told you that once? I nodded. Well, the worst wrong turn was into a Cyclops' lair in Brooklyn. They've got Cyclops in Brooklyn? I asked. You wouldn't believe how many, but that's not the point. This Cyclops, he tricked us. He managed to split us up inside this maze of corridors in an old house in Flatbush. And he could sound like anyone, Percy, just the way Tyson did aboard the Princess Andromeda. He lured us, one at a time. Thalia thought she was running to save Luke, Luke thought he heard me scream for help. And me, I was alone in the dark. I was seven years old. I couldn't even find the exit. She brushed the hair out of her face. I remember finding the main room. There were bones all over the floor. And there were Thalia and Luke and Grover, tied up and gagged, hanging from the ceiling like smoked hams. The Cyclops was starting a fire in the middle of the floor. I drew my knife, but he heard me. He turned and smiled. He spoke, and somehow he knew my dad's voice. I guess he just plucked it out of his mind. He said, Now, Annabeth, don't you worry. I love you. You can stay here with me. You can stay forever. I shivered. The way she told it, even now, six years later, freaked me out worse than any ghost story I'd ever heard. What did you do? I stabbed him in the foot. I stared at her. Are you kidding? You were seven years old and you stabbed a grown cyclops in the foot? Oh, he would have killed me. But I surprised him. It gave me just enough time to turn to Thalia and cut the ropes on her hands. She took it from there. Yeah, but still, that was pretty brave, Annabeth. She shook her head. We barely got out alive. I still have nightmares, Percy. The way that cyclops talked in my father's voice... It was his fault we took so long getting to camp. All the monsters who'd been chasing us had time to catch up. That's really why Thalia died. If it hadn't been for that Cyclops, she'd still be alive today. We sat on the deck, watching the Hercules constellation rise in the night sky. Go below, Annabeth told me at last. You need some rest. I nodded. My eyes were heavy. But when I got below and found a hammock, 
took me a long time to fall asleep. I kept thinking about Annabeth's story. I wondered, if I were her, would I have had enough courage to go on this quest, to sail straight toward the lair of another Cyclops? I didn't dream about Grover. Instead, I found myself back in Luke's stateroom aboard the Princess Andromeda. The curtains were open. It was nighttime outside. The air swirled with shadows. Voices whispered all around me. Spirits of the dead. Beware, they whispered. Traps. Trickery. Kronos's golden sarcophagus glowed faintly, the only source of light in the room. A cold laugh startled me. It seemed to come from miles below the ship. You don't have the courage, young one. You can't stop me. I knew what I had to do. I had to open that coffin. I uncapped Riptide. Ghosts whirled around me like a tornado. Beware! My heart pounded. I couldn't make my feet move, but I had to stop Kronos. I had to destroy whatever was in that box. Then a girl spoke right next to me. Well, seaweed brain? I looked over expecting to see Annabeth, but the girl wasn't Annabeth. She wore punk-style clothes with silver chains on her wrists. She had spiky black hair, dark eyeliner around her stormy blue eyes, and a spray of feckle, freckles across her nose. She looked familiar, but I wasn't sure why. Well, she asked, are we going to stop him or not? I couldn't answer. I couldn't move. The girl rolled her eyes. Fine, leave it to me and Aegis. She tapped her wrist and her silver chains transformed, flattening and expanding into a huge shield. It was silver and bronze with the monstrous face of Medusa protruding from the center. It looked like a death mask, as if the Gorgon's real head had been pressed into the metal. I didn't know if that was true or if the shield could really petrify me, but I looked away. Just being near it made me cold with fear. I got a feeling that in a real fight, the bear of that shield would be almost impossible to beat any sane enemy would turn and run. The girl drew her sword and advanced on the sarcophagus. The shadowy ghosts parted for her, scattering before the terrible aura of her shield. No, I tried to warn her, but she didn't listen. She marched straight up to the sarcophagus and pushed aside the golden lid. For a moment, she stood there, gazing down at whatever was in the box. The coffin began to glow. No, the girl's voice trembled. Can't be. From the depths of the ocean, Kronos laughed so loudly, the whole ship trembled. No, the girl screamed as the sarcophagus engulfed her in a blast of golden light. Ah! I sat bolt upright in my hammock. Annabeth was shaking me. Percy, you're having a nightmare. You need to get up. What is it? I rubbed my eyes. What's wrong? Land, she said grimly. We're approaching the island of the Sirens. I could barely make out the island ahead of us, just a dark spot in the mist. I want you to do me a favor, Annabeth said. The Sirens will be in range of their singing soon. I remembered stories about the Sirens. They sang so sweetly their voices enchanted sailors and lured them to their death. No problem, I assured her. We could just stop, stop up our ears. There's a big tube of candle wax below deck. I want to hear them. I blinked. Why? They say the sirens sing the truth about what you desire. They tell you things about yourself you didn't even realize. That's what's so enchanting. If you survive, you become wiser. I want to hear them. How often will I get that chance? Coming from most people, this would have made no sense. But Annabeth, being who she was, well, if she should struggle through ancient, could struggle through ancient Greek architecture books and enjoy documentaries on the History Channel, I guess the sirens would appeal to her too. She told me her plan. Reluctantly, I helped her get ready. As soon as the rocky coastline of the island came into view, I ordered one of the ropes to wrap around Annabeth's waist, tying her to the foremast. Don't untie me, she said. No matter what happens or how much I plead, I want to go straight over the edge and drown myself. Are you trying to tempt me? Ha ha. 
I promised I'd keep her secure. Then I took two large wads of candle wax, kneaded them into earplugs, and stuffed my ears. Annabeth nodded sarcastically, letting me know the earplugs were a real fashion statement. I made a face at her and turned to the pilot's wheel. The silence was eerie. I couldn't hear anything but the rush of blood in my head. As we approached the island, jagged rocks loomed out of the fog. I willed the Queen Anne's revenge to skirt around them. If we sailed any closer, those rocks would shred our hull like blender blades. I glanced back. At first, Annabeth seemed totally normal. Then, she got a puzzled look on her face. Her eyes widened. She strained against the ropes. She called my name. I could just tell from reading her lips. Her expression was clear. She had to get out. This was life or death. I had to let her out of the ropes right now. She seemed so miserable it was hard not to cut her free. I forced myself to look away. I urged the Queen Anne's revenge to go faster. I still couldn't see much of the island, just mist and rocks, but floating in the water were pieces of wood and fiberglass, the wreckage of old ships, even some flotation cushions from airplanes. How could music cause so many lives to veer off course? I made sure there were some top 40 songs that made me want to take a fiery nosedive, but still, what could the sirens possibly sing about? For one dangerous moment, I understood Annabeth's curiosity. I was tempted to take out the earplugs, just get a taste of the song. I could feel the sirens' voices vibrating in the timbers of the ship, pulsing along with the roar of blood in my ears. Annabeth was pleading with me. Tears streamed down her cheeks. She strained against the ropes as if they were holding her back from everything she cared about. How could you be so cruel? She seemed to be asking me. I thought you were my friend. I glared at the misty island. I wanted to uncap my sword, but there was nothing to fight. How do you fight a song? I tried hard not to look at Annabeth. I managed it for about five minutes. That was my big mistake. When I couldn't stand it any longer, I looked back and found a heap of cut ropes, an empty mast. Annabeth's bronze knife lay on the deck. Somehow, she'd managed to wiggle it into her hand. I'd totally forgotten to disarm her. I rushed to the side of the boat and saw her paddling madly for the island, the waves carrying her straight toward the jagged rocks. I screamed her name, but if she heard me, it didn't do any good. She was entranced, swimming toward her death. I looked back at the pilot's wheel and yelled, Stay. Then, I jumped over the side. I sliced into the water and willed the currents to bend around me, making a jet stream that shot me forward. I came to the surface and spotted Annabeth, but a wave caught her, sweeping her between two razor-sharp fangs of rock. I had no choice. I plunged after her. I dove under the wrecked hull of a yacht, wove through a collection of floating metal balls on chains that I realized afterward were mines. I had to use all my power over water to avoid getting smashed against the rocks or tangled in the nets of barbed wire strung just below the surface. I jetted between the two rock fangs, and found myself in a half-moon-shaped bay. The water was choked with more rocks and ship wreckage and floating mines. The beach was black volcanic sand. I looked around desperately for Annabeth. There she was. Luckily, or unluckily, she was a strong swimmer. She'd made it past the mines on the rocks. She was almost to the black beach. Then the mist cleared, and I saw them. The sirens. Imagine a flock of vultures the size of people with dirty black plumage, gray talons, and wrinkled pink necks. Now, imagine human heads on top of those necks, but the human heads keep changing. I couldn't hear them, but I could see they were singing. As their mouths moved, their faces morphed into people I knew. My mom, Poseidon, Grover, Tyson, Chiron, all the people I most wanted to see. They smiled reassuringly, inviting me forward. But no matter what shape they took, their mouths were greasy and caked with remnants of old meals. Like vultures, they'd been eating with their faces, and it didn't look like they'd been feasting on monster donuts. Annabeth swam toward them. I knew I couldn't get her out of the water. The sea was my only advantage. 
It had always protected me one way or another. I propelled myself forward and grabbed her ankle. The moment I touched her, a shock went through my body, and I saw the sirens the way Annabeth must have been seeing them. Three people sat on a picnic blanket in Central Park. A feast was spread out before them. I recognized Annabeth's dad from photos she'd shown me, an athletic-looking, sandy-haired guy in his 40s. He was holding hands with a beautiful woman who looked a lot like Annabeth. She was dressed casually, in blue jeans and a denim shirt and hiking boots. But something about the woman radiated power. I knew that I was looking at the goddess Athena. Next to them sat a young man, Luke. The whole scene glowed in a warm, buttery light. The three of them were talking and laughing, and when they saw Annabeth, their faces lit up with delight. Annabeth's mom and dad held out their arms invitingly. Luke grinned and gestured for Annabeth to sit next to him, as if he'd never betrayed her, as if he were still her friend. Behind the trees of Central Park, a city skyline rose. I caught my breath, because it was Manhattan, but not Manhattan. It had been totally rebuilt from dazzling white marble, bigger and grander than ever, with golden windows and rooftop gardens. It was better than New York, better than Mount Olympus. I knew immediately that Annabeth had designed it all. She was the architect for a whole new world. She had reunited her parents. She had saved Luke. She had done everything she ever wanted. I blinked hard. When I opened my eyes, all I saw were the sirens, ragged vultures with human faces ready to feed on another victim. I pulled Annabeth back into the surf. I couldn't hear her, but I could tell she was screaming. She kicked me in the face, but I held on. I willed the currents to carry us out into the bay. Annabeth pummeled and kicked me, making it hard to concentrate. She thrashed so much we almost collided with a floating mine. I didn't know what to do. I'd never get back to the ship alive if she kept fighting. We went under, and Annabeth stopped struggling. Her expression became confused. Then our heads broke the surface, and she started to fight again. The water. Sound didn't travel well underwater. If I could submerge her long enough, I could break the spell of the music. Of course, Annabeth wouldn't be able to breathe, but at the moment, that seemed like a minor problem. I grabbed her around the waist and ordered the waves to push us down. We shot into the depths, 10 feet, 20 feet. I knew I had to be careful because I could withstand a lot more pressure than Annabeth. She fought and struggled for breath as bubbles rose around us bubbles. I was desperate. I had to keep Annabeth alive. I managed all, I imagined all the bubbles in the sea, always churning, rising. I imagined them coming together, being pulled toward me. The sea obeyed. It was a flurry of white, a tickling sensation all around me. And when my vision cleared, Annabeth and I had huge bubble of air around us. Only our legs stuck in the water. She gasped and coughed. Her whole body shuddered, but when she looked at me, I knew the spell had been broken. She started to sob. I mean, horrible, heartbroken sobbing. She put her head on my shoulder and I held her. Fish gathered to look at us. A school of barracudas, some curious marlins. Scram, I told them. They swam off, but I could tell they went reluctantly. I swear I understood their intentions. They were about to start rumors flying around the sea about the son of Poseidon and some girl at the bottom of Siren Bay. I'll get us back to the ship, I told her. It's okay. Just hang on. Annabeth nodded to me to let me know she was better now. Then she murmured something I couldn't hear because of the wax in my ears. I made the current steer our weird little air submarine through the rocks and barbed wire and back toward the hull of the Queen Anne's Revenge, which was maintaining a slow and steady course away from the island. We stayed underwater, following the ship, until I judged we had moved out of earshot of the sirens. Then I resurfaced and our air bubble popped. I ordered a rope ladder to drop over the side of the ship, and we climbed aboard. I kept my earplugs in, just to be sure. We sailed until the island was completely out of sight. Annabeth huddled in a blanket on the forward deck. Finally, she looked up, dazed and sad, and mouthed, 
safe. I took out the earplugs. No singing. The afternoon was quiet except for the sound of the waves against the hull. The fog had burned away to a blue sky, as if the island of the sirens had never existed. You okay? I asked. The moment I said it, I realized how lame that sounded. Of course she wasn't okay. I didn't realize, she murmured. What? Her eyes were the same color as the mist over the siren's island. How powerful the temptation would be. I didn't want to admit that I had seen what the sirens had promised her. I felt like a trespasser, but I figured I owed it to Annabeth. I saw the way you rebuilt Manhattan, I told her, and Luke and your parents. She blushed. You saw that? What Luke told you back on the Princess Andromeda about starting the world from scratch? That really got to you, huh? She pulled her blanket around her. <laughs> My fatal flaw. That's what the siren showed me. My fatal flaw is hubris. I blinked. That brown stuff they spread on veggie sandwiches? She rolled her eyes. No seaweed brain. That's hummus. Hubris is worse. What could be worse than hummus? Hubris means deadly pride, Percy, thinking you can do things better than anyone else, even the gods. You feel that way? She looked down. Don't you ever feel like, what if the world really is messed up? What if we could do it all over again from scratch? No more war, nobody homeless, no more summer reading homework. I'm listening. I mean, the West represents a lot of the best things mankind ever did. That's why the fire is still burning. That's why Olympus is still around. But sometimes you just see the bad stuff, you know, and you start thinking the way Luke does. If I could tear all this down, I would do it better. Don't you ever feel that way? Like you could do a better job if you ran the world? Um, no. Me running the world would be kind of a nightmare. Then you're lucky. Hubris isn't your fatal flaw. What is? I don't know, Percy, but every hero has one. If you don't find it and learn to control it, well, they don't call it fatal for nothing. I thought about that. It didn't exactly cheer me up. I also noticed Annabeth hadn't said much about the personal things she would change, like getting her parents back together or saving Luke. I understood. I didn't want to admit how many times I dreamed of getting my own parents back together. I pictured my mom alone in our little apartment on Upper East Side. I tried to remember the smell of her blue waffles in the kitchen. It seemed so far away. So, was it worth it? I asked Annabeth. Do you feel wiser? She gazed into the distance. I'm not sure, but we have to save the camp. If we don't stop Luke... She didn't need to finish. If Luke's way of thinking could even tempt Annabeth, there's no telling how many of her half-bloods might join him. I thought about my dream of the girl on the golden sarcophagus. I wasn't sure what it meant but I got the feeling I was missing something terrible. Something terrible that Kronos was planning. What had the girl seen when she opened that coffin lid? Suddenly, Annabeth's eyes widened. Percy? I turned. Up ahead was another blotch of land, a saddle-shaped island with forested hills and white beaches and green meadows, just like I'd seen in my dreams. My nautical senses confirmed it. 30 degrees, 31 minutes north, 75 degrees, 12 minutes west. We had reached the home of the Cyclops. Chapter 14. We meet the Sheep of Doom. When you think Monster Island, you think craggy rocks and bones scattered on the beach like the Island of the Sirens. The Cyclops' island was nothing like that. I mean, okay, and had a rope bridge across a chasm, which was not a good sign. You might as well put up a billboard that said, Something evil lives here. But except for that, the place looked like a Caribbean postcard. It had green fields and tropical fruit trees and white beaches. As we sailed toward the shore, Annabeth breathed in the sweet air. The fleece, she said. I nodded. I could see the f couldn't see the fleece yet, 
but I could feel its power. I could believe it would heal anything, even Thalia's poison tree. If we take it away, will the island die? Annabeth shook her head. It'll fade, go back to what it would be normally, whatever that is. I felt a little guilty about ruining this paradise, but I reminded myself we had no choice. Camp Half-Blood was in trouble. And Tyson, Tyson would still be with us if it wasn't for this quest. In the meadow, at the base of the ravine, several dozen sheep were milling around. They looked peaceful enough, but they were huge, the size of hippos. Just past them was a path that led up into the hills. At the top of the path, near the edge of the canyon, was the massive oak tree I'd seen in my dreams. Something gold glittered around its branches. This is too easy, I said. We could just hike up there and take it? Annabeth's eyes narrowed. There's supposed to be a guardian, a dragon, or... That's when a deer emerged from the bushes. It trotted in the meadow, probably looking for grass to eat, when the sheep all bleated at once and rushed the animal. It happened so fast that the deer stumbled and was lost in a sea of wool and trampling hooves. Grass and tufts of fur flew into the air. A second later, the sheep all moved away, back to their regular peaceful wanderings. When the deer, where the deer had been, was a pile of clean white bones. Annabeth and I exchanged looks. They're like piranhas, she said. Piranhas with wool? How will we? Percy! Annabeth gasped, grabbing my arm. Look! She pointed down the beach to just below the sheep meadow, where a small boat had been run aground. The other lifeboat from the CSS Birmingham. We decided there was no way we could get past the man-eating sheep. Annabeth wanted to sneak up the path invisibly and grab the fleece, but in the end, I convinced her that something would go wrong. The sheep would smell her. Another guardian would appear, something. And if that happened, I'd be too far away to help. Besides, our first job was to find Grover and whoever had come ashore in that lifeboat, assuming they'd gotten past the sheep. I was too nervous to say what I was secretly hoping that Tyson might still be alive. We moored the Queen Anne's Revenge on the backside of the island, where the cliffs rose straight up a good 200 feet. I figured the ship was less likely to be seen there. The cliffs looked climbable, barely, about as difficult as the lava wall back at camp. At least it was free of sheep. I hoped Polymephus did not also keep carnivorous mountain goats. We rode a lifeboat to the edge of the rocks and made our way up very slowly. Annabeth went first because she was a better climber. We only came close to dying six or seven times, which I thought was pretty good. Once I lost my grip and I found myself dangling by one hand from a ledge 50 feet above the rocky surf, but I found another handhold and kept climbing. A minute later, Annabeth hit a slippery patch of moss and her foot slipped. Fortunately, she found something else to put it against. Unfortunately, that was my face. Sorry, she murmured. It's okay, I grunted, though I never really wanted to know what Annabeth's sneaker tasted like. Finally, when my fingers felt like molten lead and my arm muscles were shaking from exhaustion, we hauled ourselves over the top of the cliff and collapsed. Ugh, I said. Ouch, moaned Annabeth. Arr, bellowed another voice. If I hadn't been so tired, I would have leaped another 200 feet. I whirled around, but I couldn't see who'd spoken. Annabeth clamped her hand over my mouth. She pointed. The ledge we were sitting on was narrower than I'd realized. It dropped over the opposite side, and that's where the voice was coming from. Right below us. You're a feisty one, the deep voice bellowed. Challenge me! Clarice's voice. No doubt about it. Give me back my sword and I'll fight you! The monster roared with laughter. Annabeth and I crept to the edge. We were right above the entrance of the Cyclops' cave. Below us stood Polymephus and Grover, still in his wedding dress. Clarice was tied up, hanging upside down over a pot of boiling water. I was half hoping to see Tyson down there, too. Even if he'd been in danger, at least I would have known he was alive. But there was no sign of him. Hmm, Polymephus wondered. Eat, loudmouth girl, now. Or wait for a wedding feast. What does my bride think? He turned to Grover, who backed up 
and almost tripped over his completed bridal train. Oh, um, I'm not hungry right now, dear. Uh, perhaps? Did she say, did you say bride? Clarice demanded. Who? Grover? Next to me, Annabeth muttered, Shut up. She has to shut up. Polymephus glowered. What Grover? The satyr, Clarice yelled. Oh, Grover yelped. The poor thing's brain is boiling from that hot water. Pull her down, dear. Polymephus's eyelids narrowed over his baleful, milky eye, as if he were trying to see Clarice more clearly. The Cyclops was an even more horrible sight than he had been in my dreams, partly because his rancid smell was now up close and personal, partly because he was dressed in his wedding outfit, a crude kilt and shoulder wrap, stitched together from baby blue tuxedos, as if he'd skinned the entire wedding party. What, satyr? asked Polymephus. Satyrs are good eating. You bring me a satyr? No, you big idiot, bellowed Clarice. That satyr! Grover, the one in the wedding dress. I wanted to wring Clarice's neck, but it was too late. All I could do was watch as Polymephus turned and ripped off Grover's wedding veil, revealing his curly hair, his scruffy adolescent beard, his tiny horns. Polymephus breathed heavily, trying to contain his anger. I don't see very well, he growled. Not since many years ago, when the other hero stabbed me in the eye. But... You're no lady Cyclops! The Cyclops grabbed Grover's dress and tore it away. Underneath, the old Grover reappeared in his jeans and t-shirt. He yelped and ducked as the monster swiped over his head. Stop, Grover pleaded. Don't eat me raw. I, I have a good recipe. I reached for my sword, but Annabeth hissed. Wait. Polymephus was hesitating, a boulder in his hand, ready to smash his would-be bride. Recipe? he asked Grover. Uh, oh, yes. You don't want to eat me raw. You'll get E. coli and botulism and all sorts of horrible things. I'll taste much better grilled over a slow fire with mango chutney. You could go get some mangoes right now, down there in the woods. I'll just wait here. The monster pondered this. My heart hammered against my ribs. I figured I'd die if I charged. But I couldn't let the monster kill Grover. Grilled satyr with mango chutney, Polymephus mused. He looked back at Clarice, still hanging over the pot of boiling water. You're with satyr too? No, you overgrown pile of dung, she yelled. I'm a girl, the daughter of Ares. Now untie me so I can rip your arms off. Rip my arms off, Polymephus repeated. And stuff them down your throat. You got spunk. Let me down. Polymephus snatched up Grover as if he were a wayward puppy. Have to graze sheep now. Wedding postponed until tonight. Then we'll eat Seder for the main course. But you're still getting married? Grover sounded hurt. Who's the bride? Polymephus looked toward the boiling pot. Clarice made a strangled sound. Oh, no. You can't be serious. I'm not. Before Annabeth or I could do anything... Polymephus plucked her off the rope like she was a ripe apple and tossed her and Grover deep into the cave. Make yourself comfortable. I come back at sundown for big event. Then the Cyclops whistled, and a mixed flock of goats and sheep, smaller than the man-eaters, flooded out of the cave and passed their master. As they went to the pasture, Polymephus patted some on the back and called them by name. Beltbuster, Tammany, Lockhart, etc., when the last sheep had waddled out, Polymephus rolled a boulder in front of the doorway, as easily as I would close a refrigerator door, shutting off the sound of Clarice and Grover screaming inside. Mangoes, Polymephus grumbled to himself. What are mangoes? He strolled off down the mountain in his baby blue groom's outfit, leaving us alone with a pot of boiling water and a six-ton boulder. We tried for what seemed like hours, but it was no good. The boulder wouldn't move. We yelled into the cracks, tapped on the rock, did everything we could think of to get a signal to Grover, but if he heard us, we couldn't tell. Even if by some miracle we managed to kill Polymephus, it wouldn't do us any good. Grover and Clarice would die inside that sealed cave. The only way to move the rock 
was to have the Cyclops do it. In total frustration, I stabbed Riptide against the boulder. Sparks flew, but nothing else happened. A large rock is not the kind of enemy you can fight with a magic sword. Annabeth and I sat on the ridge in despair and watched the distant baby blue shape of the Cyclops as he moved among his flock. He had wisely divided his regular animals from his man-eating sheep, putting each group on either side of the huge crevice that divided the island. The only way across, across was the rope bridge, and the planks were much too far apart for sheep hooves. We watched as Polymephus visited his carnivorous flock on the far side. Unfortunately, they didn't eat him. In fact, they didn't seem to bother him at all. He fed them chunks of mystery meat from a great, great wicker basket, which only reinforced the feelings I've been having since Circe turned me into a guinea pig, that maybe it was time I joined Grover and became a vegetarian. Trickery, Annabeth decided. We can't beat him by force, so we'll have to use trickery. Okay, I said. What trick? I haven't figured that part out yet. Great. Polymephus will have to move the rock and let the sheep inside. At sunset, I said, which is when he'll marry Clarice and have Grover for dinner. I'm not sure which is grosser. I could get inside, she said, invisibly. What about me? The sheep, Annabeth mused. She gave me one of those sly looks that always made me wary. How much do you like sheep? Just don't let go, Annabeth said, standing invisibly somewhere off to my right. That was easy for her to say. She wasn't hanging upside down from the belly of a sheep. Now, I'll admit it, it wasn't as hard as I'd thought. I'd crawled under a car before to change my mom's oil, and this wasn't too different. The sheep didn't care. Even the Cyclops' smallest sheep were big enough to support my weight, and they had thick wool. I just twirled the stuff into handles for my hands, hooked my feet against the sheep's thigh bones, and presto, I felt like a baby wallaby, riding around against the sheep's chest, trying to keep the wool out of my mouth and my nose. In case you're wondering, the underside of a sheep doesn't smell that great. Imagine a winter sweater that's been dragged through the mud and left in the laundry hamper for a week. Something like that. The sun was going down. No sooner was I in position than the cyclops roared. Oi! Goaties! Sheepies! The flock dutifully began trudging back up the slopes toward the cave. This is it, Annabeth whispered. It'll be close by. Don't worry. I'll be close by. Don't worry. I made a silent promise to the gods that if we survived this, I'd tell Annabeth she was a genius. The frightening thing was, I knew the gods would hold me to it. My sheep taxi started plodding up the hill. After a hundred yards, my hands and feet started to hurt from holding on. I gripped the sheep's wool more tightly, and the animal made a grumbling sound. I didn't blame it. I wouldn't want anybody rock climbing on my hair either. But if I didn't hold on, I was sure I'd fall off right there in front of the monster. Hasenfepper, said the Cyclops, patting one of the sheep in front of me. Einstein, Widget! Hey there, Widget! Polymephus patted my sheep and nearly knocked me to the ground. Putting on some extra mutton there. Uh-oh, I thought. Here it comes. But Polymephus just laughed and swatted the sheep's rear end, propelling us forward. Go on, fatty. Soon Polymephus will eat you for breakfast. And just like that, I was in the cave. I could see the last of the sheep coming inside, if Annabeth didn't pull off her distraction soon. The Cyclops was about to roll the stone back into place when from somewhere outside, Annabeth shouted, Hello, ugly! Polymephus stiffened. Who said that? Nobody! Annabeth yelled. That got exactly the reaction she'd been hoping for. The monster's face turned red with rage. Nobody! Polymephus yelled back. I remember you. You're too stupid to remember anybody, Annabeth taunted. Much less nobody. I hoped to the gods she was already moving when she said that, because Polymephus bellowed furiously, grabbed the nearest boulder, which happened to be his front door, and threw it toward the sound of Annabeth's voice. I heard the rock smash into a thousand fragments. For a terrible moment, there was silence. Then Annabeth shouted, you haven't learned to throw any better either. Polymephus howled. Come here. Let me kill you, nobody. You can't kill nobody, you stupid oaf, she taunted. 
Come find me. Polymethus barreled down the hill toward her voice. Now, the nobody thing would have made sense to anybody but Annabeth, but Annabeth had explained to me that it was the name Odysseus had used to trick Polymethus centuries ago, right before he poked the Cyclops' eye out with a large hot stick. Annabeth had figured Polymethus would still have a grudge about that name, and she was right. In his frenzy to find his old enemy, he forgot about resealing the cave entrance. Apparently, he didn't even stop to consider that Annabeth's voice was female, whereas the first nobody had been male. On the other hand, he'd wanted to marry Grover, so he couldn't have been all that bright about the whole male-female thing. I just hoped Annabeth could stay alive and keep distracting him long enough for me to find Grover and Clarice. I dropped off to my ri- ride, dropped off my ride, patted Widget on his head, and apologized. I searched the main room, but there was no sign of Grover or Clarice. I pushed through the crowd of sheep and goats toward the back of the cave. Even though I dreamed about this place, I had a hard time finding my way through the maze. I ran down corridors littered with bones, past rooms full of sheepskin rugs and life-size cement sheep that I recognized as the work of Medusa. There were collections of sheep t-shirts, large tubs of lanolin cream, and woolly coats, socks, and hats with ram's horns. Finally, I found the spinning room, where Grover was huddled in the corner, trying to cut Clarice's bonds with a pair of safety scissors. It's no good, Clarice said. This rope is like iron. Just a few more minutes. Grover, she cried exasperated. You've been working at it for hours. And then they saw me. Percy, Clarice said. You're supposed to be blown up. Good to see you too. Now hold still while I... Percy, Grover bleated and tackled me with a goat hug. You heard me. You came. Yeah, buddy, I said. Of course I came. Where's Annabeth? Outside, I said. But there's no time to talk. Clarice, hold still. I uncapped Riptide and sliced off her ropes. She stood stiffly, rubbing her wrists. She glared at me for a moment, then looked at the ground and mumbled, Thanks. You're welcome, I said. Now, was anyone else on board your lifeboat? Clarice looked surprised. No, just me. Everybody else aboard the Birmingham. Well, I don't even know how you guys made it. I looked down, trying not to believe that my last hope of seeing Tyson alive had just been crushed. Okay, come on then. We have to help. An explosion echoed through the cave, followed by a scream that told me we might be too late. It was Annabeth, crying out in fear.